Hello everyone, welcome to the UIMS Pathophysiology Endocrinology series. I'm Maria and today I'll be talking about Addison's disease and hyperaldosteronism. Now the diseases that we're going to talk about today arise because of imbalances of hormones produced by the adrenal glands. Recall from anatomy and histology that the adrenal glands have two main regions, the cortex and the medulla, out of which the cortex from the outermost to the innermost layer can be subdivided into the zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. Out of these, um, the zona glomerulosa produces a corticosteroid hormone called aldosterone. It is a mineralocorticoid because it regulates salt and water balances in our blood. And because it regulates salt and water balances, it also controls blood pressure indirectly. Now to really understand the function of aldosterone, you just have to remember these two ions, sodium and potassium, and what aldosterone does to influence the serum concentration of sodium and potassium. Because it's influencing sodium, it also influences blood pressure by controlling the blood volume. So how it does so is by reabsorbing sodium and excreting potassium in the kidney and thereby influencing the water retention and water loss, leading to changes in the blood volume and subsequently in the blood pressure. And if you just keep sodium and potassium in mind, understanding the pathogenesis of any disease that arises because of like dysregulation of aldosterone becomes really easy. So naturally, dysregulation of aldosterone will be pathogenic and it will contribute to the development of cardiovascular and kidney diseases. The other important things to remember is that it is an integral part of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which you remember from physiology, I hope. And like most other hormones, it has a negative feedback loop. So aldosterone deficiency is naturally going to lead to hypoaldosteronism, and its excess is going to lead to hyperaldosteronism, which is pretty self-explanatory. However, in this lecture, we're only going to cover aldosterone deficiency in the form of Addison's disease, which doesn't just involve aldosterone, it also involves the other adrenal hormones like cortisol and even androgens to some extent. Whereas primary hyperaldosteronism is simply known as hyperaldosteronism, and we will be doing that. Now, the mechanism of action of aldosterone is in the distal convoluted tubules of our nephrons, we have these cells called principal cells. And on the principal cells, basolateral surface, we have receptors for aldosterone, and we also have sodium and potassium pumps. Now, when aldosterone is binding to these receptors, it's going to stimulate these pumps to work even harder than they already are. And when that happens, the pump is going to take potassium from the blood and excrete it into the urine, and the other way around for, uh, for sodium. It's going to take sodium from the urine and drive it into the blood. Now, the unspoken rule of physiology in general is that wherever sodium goes, the water is going to follow. So as it absorbs more and more sodium, it also absorbs more and more water, which leads to an increase in blood volume and subsequently in blood pressure. So we're going to briefly mention cortisol because it is relevant to the diseases that we're going to be discussing today. But if you want more information on this, you can watch the video on Cushing's disease. So this too is a steroid hormone. It is a glucocorticoid, unlike aldosterone, which is a mineral corticoid. And the reason we call it a glucocorticoid is because its most important effect is the regulation of glucose formation via stimulating gluconeogenesis in periods of starvation or in the general feeding cycle of our body. Immunosuppression increased insulin resistance, blood pressure elevation, and the inhibition of bone formation. So now that we're done talking about the hormones, let's move on to the diseases. First off, we have Addison's disease, which is also known as primary adrenal insufficiency. It's basically a rare long-term endocrine disorder characterized by the inadequate production of both cortisol and aldosterone. So it's basically an adrenal insufficiency. Now, isolated hypoaldosteronism is actually quite rare. And typically when you do have hypoaldosteronism, it's going to be part of a disease like Addison's disease. And the symptoms of this are actually quite slow in onset and they may be insidious. And it could include abdominal pain, gastrointestinal abnormalities, weakness, weight loss. But perhaps the most characteristic symptom is going to be the darkening of the skin, uh, basically hyperpigmentation. And we will explain why in the pathogenesis of this disease. But before we move on to the pathogenesis, let's just mention the etiologies of the Addison disease. Um, typically, it is because of the destruction of the adrenal parenchyma. And I should also mention right now that the adrenal glands have a quite large reserve. So the majority of the parenchyma would have to be destroyed before symptoms of any deficiency even manifest. Around 70 to 80% of the tissue would have to be destroyed. So the most common uh, cause of this destruction is an autoimmune adrenalitis. It is when 
antibodies are produced against the enzyme 21 alpha hydroxylase and this may be isolated or it could be part of a syndrome called autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome in which other hormone producing organs like the thyroid and the pancreas are also affected. Uh, adrenal destruction is also a feature of heritage diseases such as X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. Maybe the adrenal glands could be involved in some sort of metastasis in which uh, cancers from elsewhere seed into the adrenal glands and take over the parenchyma so you don't have enough of the hormones being produced. It could be due to hemorrhage, such as in waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome or antiphospholipid syndrome. Or it could be due to disseminated systemic infections like tuberculosis, histoplasmosis and coccidiomycosis. Uh, the latter two are fungal diseases. Lastly, it could be because of amyloidosis in which you have the deposition of abnormal proteins in the parenchyma of the adrenal gland. Now about the pathogenesis of Addison's disease, either one or all the three layers of the adrenal cortex could be affected by the etiologies that I mentioned on the previous slide. So let's say the zona glomerulosa has been affected the worst. We do not have enough aldosterone. Now, a decrease in aldosterone will mean that there is a concurrent decrease in the excretion of potassium ions, leading to their buildup in the blood, resulting in a condition called hyperkalemia. And whenever we have hyperkalemia, we are at the risk of developing metabolic acidosis. Why this happens is because in a usual situation, hydrogen typically diffuses into the cells and keeps the blood pH normal. However, when there is a high extracellular concentration of potassium ions, the hydrogen is no longer able to diffuse into the cell as effectively and it will build up in the blood. Therefore, the pH of the blood will be lowered and we have acidosis. So always remember, low aldosterone, hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis. Sodium, on the other hand, is no longer being reabsorbed as effectively because we do not have enough aldosterone. And so with sodium, even water is not being absorbed properly. This is going to lead to a situation called hypotonic hyponatremia. And this is very um, interesting because people who have Addison's disease typically have intense cravings for very salty food because they need to compensate for the loss of sodium in some way or the other. So they try to do it via their diet. And so a craving for salty food is a very typical symptom for Addison's disease. Not only that, because we do not have enough water being reabsorbed, there will be a decrease in the blood volume, so hypovolemia, and consequently hypotension. So damage to the zona fasciculata is going to lead to decreased levels of cortisol and hypocortisolism manifests in a number of ways. First of all, it leads to an overactive pituitary gland. Uh, the pituitary is trying to compensate for the low levels of circulating cholesterol by increasing ACTH. And in order to increase ACTH, it has to first increase the production of pro melanocortinin, POMC for short. This, however, has a very undesirable side effect. It also increases the levels of MSH because this has a dual effect. It increases ACTH as well as MSH. And MSH is going to lead to the overactivity of melanocytes in your skin, leading to the hyperpigmentation or the bronze skin, which is a very characteristic feature of Addison's disease. The next thing it does is it increases the level of antidiuretic hormone or ADH. And this is going to lead to the reabsorption of water in your collecting tubules collecting ducts and distal convoluted tubules. So we already had hyponatremia because of low aldosterone, but now we also have an excessive amount of water being reabsorbed. This leads to a dilutional hyponatremia or a hypotonic hyponatremia that I, that I mentioned on the previous slide. Finally, there will be a decrease in the expression of enzymes that are involved in gluconeogenesis, and that causes low gluconeogenesis rates leading to hypoglycemia, which is the complete opposite of what happens in Cushing disease. Finally, because cortisol is involved in the potentiation of the action of catecholamines, a lack of cortisol means that this potentiation is no longer happening and we have hypotension. So we have hypotension because of two reasons. One, there is not enough blood volume and two, there is not enough cortisol. Androgens too may be affected by Addison's disease if uh, the zona reticularis has been affected. Uh, however, uh, it's not very commonly observed in people presenting with Addison's disease. When it does occur, then the loss of libido and impaired spermatogenesis are the symptoms. Now, diagnosis can be as simple as a blood test checking for sodium, potassium, cortisol, and ACTH levels, a serological test, which would be looking for antibodies against 21-alpha-hydroxylase, uh, for example, 
Or we could perform something a bit more complicated like a hormone stimulation test, like the ACTH sim stimulation test or the glucagon stimulation test. Insulin-induced hypoglycemia is another test trying to diagnose secondary adrenal insufficiency. Or um, we could perform imaging tests if we suspect that there is some abnormality in the size of either the adrenals or the pituitary. Treatment is quite simple. We simply prescribe hormone re replacement therapy to correct the levels of the missing hormones. The next disease we're going to talk about is hyperaldosteronism, which is basically a medical condition in which too much aldosterone is being produced by the adrenal glands, leading to low levels of potassium in the blood. So in the previous one, we had hyperkalemia because of too little aldosterone. Here we have too much aldosterone. So we're going to have the opposite, right? So hypokalemia. And because of this hypokalemia, we have an increased excretion of hydrogen ions leading to alkalosis. So it's typically asymptomatic, but when it does become severe, then the following symptoms are present. Hyperaldosteronism can be primary or secondary. When it's primary, it's because of an adrenal hyperplasia or an adrenal adenoma, in which case we call it Kohn syndrome. Now, these two lead to the hyperplasia of the cells in the zona glomerulosa. When it's secondary, it's usually because of the overactivity of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system. And that this could be because of a number of reasons. It could be because of a renin producing tumor or a juxtaglomerular apparatus tumor because of renal artery stenosis or fibromuscular dysplasia, which causes renal artery stenosis. Or it could be genetic, such as in the case of uh, Barter syndrome or Kettleman syndrome. Now, the pathogenesis of this disease is quite simple, and it's basically the opposite of what happens in Addison's disease. So because we have too much aldosterone, we will be reabsorbing too much sodium from the open sodium channels in the principal cells of the distal collecting tubule and also the cortical collecting ducts. Not only that, uh, the sodium reabsorption is also going to lead to water reabsorption, leading to hypervolemia and then subsequently hypertension. But I should also explain a phenomenon known as aldosterone escape, by which our body can sometimes counteract the effect of this hypervolemia. What happens is that when there is the sodium and water retention, there is a volume expansion. But this volume expansion also leads to the secretion of ANP or atrial natriuretic peptide, and this causes pressure natriuresis. So there is a compensatory diuresis, um, an escape from edema formation and hypernatremia. So the diagnosis of this disease is quite simple. We look at the plasma aldosterone concentration and the plasma renin activity, and using these two parameters, we derive the aldosterone to renin ratio, which can then help us determine whether it is a primary hyperaldosteronism or a secondary hyperaldosteronism. So if it is an elevated ARR or an elevated ratio of aldosterone to renin, then our screening result is positive. However, um, to avoid false positive, we should also check it with the plasma aldosterone concentration. And once it has been confirmed, the hyperaldosteronism, then we use imaging to determine the underlying cause and select the treatment. The treatment itself involves using aldosterone receptor antagonists, which is either spironolactone or epilirinone.